2018's Bree Shackelford now has a recap. It's finally that time, folks. It is time for Purdue men's basketball to take to the court here in the Big Ten tournament for the very first time. They'll be facing the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers, which is a team that managed to knock Purdue off the number one spot earlier in the season. Well, let's jump into the action now and see who came out victorious. And right from the tip, this game was physical. and You could tell everyone was fighting their hardest to get to the next game. Rutgers struck first and struck hard going up on Purdue by quite a few in the first minutes of the game. Scarlet Knights were dunking, sealing passes left and right, and making things very difficult for the Boilermakers. Purdue was trying to find its footing in order to not let this game get out of hand, and it looked like Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer weren't going to be the team's saving grace. Painter quickly made changes, and once David Jenkins Jr. was in, it was all said and done. Jenkins would give Purdue the boost they needed, and just like that, Boilers were up 29-28 at half. Then this team came alive in the second half. Mason Gillis seemed unstoppable, finishing the game shooting 88% from the field with 20 points and 9 rebounds. And Jenkins still shined bright and showed us that he really does hate shot clocks, beating the buzzer several times and helping Purdue get ahead. The vet would come away from this one, perfect from outside the arc, having 12 on the day. Boilers managed to outshoot Rutgers by 7% from the field and come away with the victory 70 to 65 and not only get their revenge win, but move on to the semis. Sports 18's Maya D'Addario joins us now with post game reaction. Survive in advance, that's what Purdue did today. Now let's head to the post game presser to hear thoughts from head coach Matt Painter and players. Proud of our guys uh, for hanging in there, obviously. We had some Keystone Cops moments there in the last three minutes. But I thought our effort was really good. I thought we embraced the physicality. Um, Rutgers had beaten us five out of our last six games, and and most of them have been really close games. Just thought they had a little bit more edge than we've had here the past three, four years. Not to say that we were tougher than them tonight, but we were much better than we've been. Two players who stepped up to outperform the Scarlet Knights were David Jenkins Jr. and Mason Gillis. Gillis topped the team with 20 points. He says he refused to get outplayed by Rutgers for a second time this season. I just went into the game knowing that they have outcompeted us, outsuffed us the past couple of years, and so I knew my mentality was that I had to get on the boards and set that tone. And Jenkins Jr. says while the win against the Scarlet Knights feels nice, in a win or go home situation, that feeling doesn't last long. I think we did a good job of getting it past the half court and kind of just getting into our offense, but it feels good to get a win versus them. But I mean, obviously that's a temporary feeling because we got a, a next game tomorrow. We got to be prepared for that. Well, Bree and Maddie up in Chicago. We'll hear more from them coming up at 6. Well, Purdue student government is responding to calls for action in light of February's Michigan State shooting. PSG chose to host a town hall where students had the chance to hear from Purdue police and voice their own concerns. That event taking place in Lilly Hall on Purdue's campus. The uh, several representatives from Purdue government as well as Purdue police were on hand. While students had the opportunity for open dialogue, police also shared several steps that they're taking to ensure safety. Purdue student government deputy chief of staff Braden Johnson says training is not limited to police officers when it comes to an active threat situation. Well, Purdue's spring break begins tomorrow with many students heading out of town. Student breaks happen a couple of times throughout the year, leaving a piece of Greater Lafayette much quieter. A majority of the students either head back home for the break or go on trips with their friends. There are students who stay on campus, though, for various reasons. This upcoming week will be a preview for the summer ahead. Purdue student Tori Ledesma says she knows only one person who is actually staying on campus. Yeah, I think almost all my friends are traveling. I think there's like a handful that are just going home or staying on campus, though. Well, most students will be leaving after their final class today. We'll have more on how Purdue's spring break will impact nearby businesses coming up. And now to weather. We could see some uh, rain tonight, possibly, and some measurable snow for the weekend. Chief Meteorologist Chad Evans joins us now with the latest look. Chad? Yeah, pretty gray raw day, Jeff. Temperatures only running 34 to 37 right now with this Stiff north northwest wind blowing. We've had a pretty strong wind for several days now. It feels like it's in the 20s. 
Feels like it's 25 Kokomo, 27 Delphi, and 27 at floor. And we've had a few little spotty rain, snow, sleet showers today, or just a few random little spits of flurries or sprinkles around, and still a few of those drifting in from the north. Uh, so if you're headed out to games this evening, yeah, there'll be a few of these around, but no big deal, no slick roads or anything like that. This is the system that'll bring the measurable snow by Saturday night, but we dropped a freezing by 11 this evening. A few breaks in the clouds, a few little spits of, of uh, rain or snow, and then down to 28 for the low tonight with breaks in the clouds here and there, but the winds beginning to diminish. Lows generally upper 20s to right around 30 degrees. 29 floral dropped to 29 at Fowler, 29 at Rensselaer, and about 30 over here towards Peru. But we're tracking that snow. It should really accumulate between about 1 a.m. and 8 a.m. Saturday night. And we'll have the latest amounts expected next. All right, Chad, thank you. A controversial annexation is on hold after the property owners pulled the request at the Lafayette City Council. The Carr family had offered the property at the corner of Dayton Road and County Road 200 South to the city last month. But at this week's council meeting, the family pulled the annexation request after discovering that their LLC had expired and no longer exists. The Dayton Town Council opposes the annexation into Lafayette. Dayton has had a development plan for that at site since 1996 and council members say they were surprised to learn of the annexation proposal. Town board member Mark Burmester says the town is actively trying to annex that land into the town of Dayton. So that that always has been the the growth area for Dayton uh, and um, it now looks like um, we need we need to start moving on that and, and that's what we're doing. The annexation proposal is not dead. The Carr family's attorney says their intention is to refile the petition at a later date. Lafayette Mayor Tony Roswarski says he's looking forward to that. We'll hear from him coming up on News 18 at 6. About 1,400 residents of Benton County were without power after a car crash near Oxford early this morning. It happened just after 2.30 on County Road 500 South, northwest of Oxford. 500 South between County Roads 3. 300 East and 100 East was closed uh, at the time. Take a look at this uh, viewer submitted photo from the scene. Sheriff John Cox says a car hit a utility pole and then became engulfed in flames. Officers searched the area, finding two adults and two children hiding in a field near the car. No one appears to have been hurt during the crash. Nipsco said they expected to restore power to that area sometime this morning. We'll have more when that becomes available to us. Well, a memorial is planned for a Covington teenager who tragically committed suicide. 13-year-old Terry Badger III died on March 6th. Numerous reports to News 18 were blaming his death on bullying. The community is encouraged to join a memorial walk at 4 p.m. tomorrow. That walk starts in the Covington Middle School parking lot and ends at the baseball fields in Covington City Park. A balloon release and a candlelight vigil will follow. Badger was an avid baseball player and overall athlete. Well, a police report has been filed after a child brought a gun to a Lawrence Township school this week. The school says it happened because a parent put the weapon in the student's backpack and then forgot that it was there. Eric Graves has the story. It's not very often that I don't have the words. Julie Questenberry, the president of the Indiana School Resource Officers Association, says she is shocked to hear a parent left a gun in a student's backpack. We cannot continue to get the easy things wrong. And that is an easy thing. A statement from Lawrence Township Schools says a Mary Castle Elementary parent stored a gun in her student's backpack Monday and neglected to take it out, leading to the student bringing the gun to school Tuesday. If you're responsible enough to purchase a gun, you should be responsible enough to know where it is and to secure it at all times. Man, to think about uh, a parent putting their child in that situation is pretty rough. Joe Garrison is a Mary Castle parent. He got an email from the school Wednesday explaining what happened. In the letter, the Mary Castle principal says a different parent reported their child said there was a gun on their school bus Tuesday. I mean, most worried about the kid that had the gun in their backpack. I mean, they're probably the most at risk. A police report was filed showing the student involved is seven years old and the gun was placed there by their mother. Questenberry says the mother could face charges. If a parent leaves a gun in a kid's backpack, 
that's a really big problem and the law agrees with that. Lawrence Township Schools says the school district is utilizing both legal recourse and social services to address the issue. It's very appropriate for DCS to be involved. Questenberry says the best advice for kids when it comes to guns is... If you ever see a gun, I need you to do two things. Don't touch it and tell an adult. Again, that was Eric Graves reporting. Though there are strong signals today that Donald Trump could soon be charged with a crime. The former president lashed out at prosecutors in New York again last night. They are investigating an alleged hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels and whether it was classified as a legal expense during his 2016 presidential campaign. It would be the first time that a former American president is charged with a crime. The grand jury is investigating business records involving a $130,000 payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels days before the 2016 election. Daniels has claimed that she had an affair with Trump. He denies it. The offer to testify a likely means criminal charges could be on the way because New York state law requires potential defendants to be given that option. This may not be the only legal challenge that Trump is facing. A Georgia grand jury recently recommended several indictments, according to the four-person, as prosecutors consider charges in the possible interference in the 2020 election. And the Justice Department also has ongoing federal investigations. Trump has said all three pro are politically motivated. He denies wrongdoing, telling reporters last week that even if he is indicted, he plans to continue his presidential campaign. Well, a man who admitted to shooting and killing his wife on Monday morning is walking free today. Indianapolis police say the investigation into that incident is ongoing. Eric Graves looked into court documents that outlined what happened. Early Monday morning, IMPD showed up to the 6,000 block of Oak Avenue on the east side. According to court documents, they found 37-year-old David Brinker next to his wife, 36-year-old Dorothy Poley, with a gunshot wound to her chest. Dorothy later died in the middle of Oak Avenue, where police first found her. Court documents outline the story Brinker told police. In the documents, Brinker alleges he and his wife Dorothy got into a fight. Healthy relationships require being able to talk through and have um, healthy conflict and healthy re resolution. Kelly McBride with the Domestic uh, Violence yeah. Network says one in three women and one in seven men experience domestic violence. Brinker says he tried to stop Polly from driving off and his gun discharged when he went to open the car door through the window, shooting Polly in the chest. We are more likely to hurt somebody that we love than be hurt by somebody that we don't know. In the documents, Brinker admits to shooting and killing his wife, but he was not arrested. The Marion County Prosecutor's Office says IMPD consulted with someone at their office and a decision was made to not press charges at that time. IMPD says this is a criminal homicide and their investigation is still open, but they do not have updates right now. Officers did use the Jake Laird law, Indiana's red flag law, to seize seven guns inside Brinker's home. The law allows law enforcement to take weapons from people who could be dangerous to themselves or others. Meanwhile, Kelly McBride wants domestic violence victims to know there are resources out there. If you're in a domestic violence relationship, help is available. You can call the ND Champions. Again, that was Eric Graves reporting Indiana's red flag law also requires officials to make a good faith effort to hold a court hearing within 14 days from when a search warrant was first filed. All right, tomorrow we're going to be watching the clouds returning. The clouds try to break up a little bit, but then they kind of turn overcast. The sky turns overcast again later on in the day, kind of breezy. 41 for the high and then the snow begins to come in overnight Saturday nights. The latest on amounts are coming up.
And now, your Storm Team 18 forecast. Weather from where you live. All right, so there are your highs for tomorrow. 37 to 43, generally area-wide. 37, Winnemac, 37, Logan's Fort, but 41 at Attica. 43 at Vetersburg on Sunday we're 35 to 40 after a period of snow pretty much uh, most of the accumulation is going to be between 1 a.m. and around 8 a.m. Uh, by uh, Sunday morning and then after that just perhaps a few flakes here and there Sunday afternoon a few breaks in the clouds kind of brisk uh, high in the 30s 37 of Greater Lafayette but high as 35 to 40 should do it viewing area wide 35 Logansport 39 Attica, 35 Morocco, we'll get up to about 40 at Vetersburg. So again, through the evening, a few little flakes, a few little spits of snow, sprinkle or two, and then we get some breaks in the clouds here and there tonight, and some breaks in the clouds tomorrow morning, but then we cloud up again with time tomorrow afternoon. And here comes the precip. It may start out as a little bit of rain snow mix briefly, then quickly go to snow. And generally between roughly 1 a.m. and about 8, that's when most of the snow is going to come down. This is 3 o'clock in the morning. You'll see widespread snow over the area and snow at 6 a.m. Then the main accumulating snows pull away, though still at least some scattered snow showers through 10 o'clock in the morning. And even Sunday afternoon, we'll have a few little spits of snow showers here and there. Now it looks like about a 1 to 2 and a half inch snow for Saturday night. Very slushy, very wet. Temperatures kind of hovering around 31 degrees. So one to two and a half should do it viewing area wide as the cooler pattern settles in. I mean, fall spring is over. It's going to feel more like winter for a while. Temperature is in the blue below normal all across our area right through the weekend, right into early next week. Now the thing is, by the time we get to late next week, like uh, roughly around Thursday, uh, temperatures will actually go to about normal. But then behind that, this chunk of cold air will roll in. So any normal temperatures will be very brief and then temperatures go back below normal yet once again. All right, so breezy 41 tomorrow, 31 with the snow tomorrow night. A couple snow showers Sunday. Remember we spring forward Sunday morning, 37 for the high. A few scattered snow showers on Monday are possible, kind of blustery, cold at 35, 35 on Tuesday, 43 Wednesday, but still below normal, 21 during the morning. Notice the normal high is 47, so we're back up near, if not just a hair above normal on, on the Thursday. We get the rain late in the day, but look what happens Friday. A scattering of snow showers, highs back in the 30s, and we got to watch for some snow perhaps late next weekend. And then early that following week, note highs below normal, running in the 